Well, for those who have joined us, thank you very, very much for taking some time out of a weekday evening. Um, I think I've met most of you either through our work at the city or through attending planning team meetings uh, that you're involved with. But my name is Chris Ryerson. I'm a planning administrator with the city's uh, planning department. Uh, my role is to work with the project managers that you all know to oversee our sub area planning efforts across the city. Um, and you may have caught it from uh, the email that invited you to this, but we've invited folks from all six planning teams uh, of the plans that we're working on right now. So for those who aren't aware of all of those, we're currently working on plans in the Stone Oak area, the Rolling Oaks area, the Greater Airport area, uh, and the Fort Sam Houston area. Those are all regional center plans that uh, many of you are involved in. And then we're also currently working on two community area plans, one in the far east and then one in the south. Uh, and so we've got quite a diversity of um, areas that we're working in and thus a diversity of, of folks joining us for the call tonight, which is great. And we hope it generates some uh, good questions for Sarah and her team. Um, and so anyway, we're very happy to have you. As you know, we really try to tailor our each plan uh, you know, to your area, and that's why we rely on your feedback and the feedback of, of the community members that you connect us with. But in some cases, we really do encounter issues that are citywide in nature. Um, and so we always think it's important to try to bring in uh, expert, although Sarah won't call herself that, but bring in expert um, guidance on these citywide issues and citywide policies that we need to try to adapt and incorporate into our plans. Um, and, you know, within the strategic housing implementation plan that Sarah and her team are going to talk about, there's numerous different strategies. So not every strategy is going to apply to your area. Uh, you know, I think we would all say there's no, you know, silver bullet or one size fits all solution. Uh, but the hope is that by learning more about the ship tonight and discussing it in future planning team meetings, uh, that each planning team uh, member and each planning team collectively starts to understand uh, the tools that are at their disposal, the policies that have been adopted by the city, um, and the ways that we can work as a community to address the really important housing problems uh, that we know we all face. So Sarah and Mark uh, Carmona, who Sarah's going to introduce, uh, they will speak about this much more eloquently than me. So I think rather than go on about it. I think I will just turn it over to Sarah Wamsley and Mark Carmona and let them introduce themselves and then start talking about uh, the presentation. Awesome. Thanks, Chris, and, and thank you all for being on and for volunteering so much of your time to be part of a really important process. Um, that's, that's a really big deal and know that it's appreciated by us and definitely by your neighbors um, who are going to benefit from your work for a long time. So thank you. Um, my name is Sarah Wamsley Estrada. I am the Housing Policy Administrator for the City of San Antonio. And uh, what that means is I get to oversee strategic initiatives related to our Strategic Housing Implementation Plan, or SHIP. And we'll talk specifically about what that is. But I do want to introduce a couple of my colleagues that are on and, and shout out to James and Mona and the team that are all on here listening today. Um, but very importantly, we have Mark Carmona, our Chief Housing Officer. Um, Mark, in and of himself, is you know part of our, our ship success. He really is the captain, if you will entertain one more nautical theme uh, term here. And uh, you know, one of the things that the community identified in the housing policy framework back in 2018 was the need for someone um, to really drive that, to be the touch point the unifying piece of a lot of housing functions in the city. So um, certainly not a small task, but Mark has stepped into it a little under a year ago, um, just really graciously and, and wonderfully, and we're so lucky to have him. So um, without further ado, Mark, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Mark Carmona. I'm the Chief Housing Officer for the city. Um, I'm having some internet problems right now, so hopefully I will not freeze up on you guys, but just wanted to let you know, happy to be here. Um, happy to uh, be a part of this presentation tonight. Um, the role of the Chief Housing Officer really is to oversee the implementation of the Strategic Housing Implementation Plan. But as I've been working in community for a while with different folks, my mantra has been, we need everyone, and we do. We need everyone to play a role to be able to accomplish what we've laid out in the SHIP document. Um, what I love about the SHIP is that there is an opportunity for everyone in every walk of life to participate and to have a role. 
I don't know if y'all can still hear me or not. We can hear you. Okay, good. Yeah, so anyway, good. all right. So um, anyway, I um, I just welcome the opportunity to be with y'all this evening. Thank you for your service. And I, I will be here with Sarah and the team um, to answer any questions. Um, and happy to, to come out to your organizations and share more about the ship and provide a little bit more information about the housing bond if you want. So happy to do that as well. Wanted to make that offer to this group. Thank you. Sarah, Sarah you're muted. muted. I was saying something really, really brilliant. So <laughs> just pretend. Um, <laughs> just kidding. I wanted to introduce uh, Sibone Diaz Sanchez as well. She is our community engagement administrator. Um, Sibone, you want to say hi? Just that. Hi. Community engagement administrator for NHSD. Um, I know a couple of you on this call through my architecture life. So hello. Thanks. Or zoning Ibone. commission life. Yeah. It's complicated, but I'm excited to be here because I have not. Um, I came in partially because SHIP was adopted by City Council and in hopes of the housing bond. So the week that I started was in May. And it was the week before the housing bond was passed. So I moved back to San Antonio because of SHIP and the housing bond. Thank you, Sibone, for being here and for moving back. And then a little shout out as well to the rest of our NHSD team, James McKenzie, Mona Murro, and Maribel Arauza. Um, as well, uh, Christine Vigna is on and she was one of our um, one of our leaders in crafting the ship. Thank you so much, Christine, for being here. You can keep me honest. All right, and so many of you who you know work within the city or um, with council, um, thank you for your work on this and, and uh, as we move forward. So without further ado, let me jump into um, presenting. All right, how does this look for you all? Is it the view that we want to see? It's fine. And unless there's going to be a uh, small font yeah. on the slides um the the view is a small oh, yeah that's that's great. that's better. That it that's okay. better yes all that's right the one. yay thank you so we'll just jump in this is a, a high level introduction to the strategic housing implementation plan um i cannot see the chat or your faces so I'm going to lean on Chris to kind of um, just interrupt me if there's something that I need to slow down or address. All right, so what I have planned for us is just to kind of go through what the ship is. There are four key components to this document and we'll walk through quickly each of them. The definition of affordability, what, is even, what does even that mean, right? Um, our new production and preservation goals for the next 10 years how we plan to pay for those things, and then our ship strategies. There are 36 of them. Um, we're not gonna go through each of them individually. I just pulled a few that I thought might be more relevant to you um, in your work. And certainly we'll make sure that you all have the link to view the full ship document. And um, we'd love your questions, comments, um, and review of those things. Um, after we go through the presentation, uh, I'd love to open it up for a conversation with you all to talk a little bit about what elements of the ship, at least the ones that you got to see today, right, um, resonate with you and how you see the ship and your sub area plans really shaping housing affordability in your sub area. So just an exercise to kind of get the wheels turning. I know you all are all taking in a lot of content over the course of these last few months. Um, and so I hope that housing gets to be a big part of that. And just um, by as a way of an aside, this family that you see in this picture are a family that we helped through our emergency housing assistance program. Um, so the pictures in here are, are real clients uh, who have benefited from the housing work and we are grateful that they shared their space in their home with us um, with their cute dog who has sort of become our unofficial ship mascot. All right, so what is it? What is the ship? You know, at the end of the day, 
This is a 10-year vision for housing affordability in San Antonio. Um, and it's a shared vision, right? It's not just the city. Um, it's also been adopted by the San Antonio Housing Trust, Opportunity Home, which a lot of you probably know as Saha. They have changed their name, um, is also a collaborator on this, as well as Bear County. So actually tomorrow at uh, a council committee called Planning and Community Development, or PCDC, um, these four organizations will come together and, and give a presentation and update on uh, where we've been sort of since the ship was adopted um, just recently, back in December of last year, so less than a year ago. But the ship itself uh, is those four key components. The definition of affordability, our new goals, our 10-year outlook, and our 36 strategies many of which we sourced from a lot of other initiatives going on in the city. Um, so where we didn't need to recreate the wheel on, you know, housing and climate or housing and health, uh, we didn't do that. We chose to pull from work that had already been done. So the first thing um, that I want you to know when we talk about housing affordability is that there was a lot of thought that went into defining what this even means. Um, our housing commission went through an eight month, an eight month process um, talking to public utilities, talking to residents, talking to affordable housing providers um, to figure out what made sense. And um, I'm assuming some of you have heard the term AMI before. That means area median income. And it is a measure that comes from the Department of House U.S. Housing and Urban Development um, that basically says this is the median income for this entire community. They update it every year, and this figure is not without some controversy, right? Um, usually, traditionally, we define affordable housing and even lots of social services um, as being really for people with 80% of the area median income. So a little bit, you know, towards the bottom half of income spectrums. But what we found in San Antonio and have heard, you know, multiple times over the years is, well, the way HUD defines our area includes New Braunfels and all these other areas that are wealthy and maybe 80% of, of AMI is not actually really that affordable for people, right? So what Housing Commission ultimately did was say, we're going to use that same measuring stick that HUD has set for us. We're going to use that income group. But we're going to say that 80% is not does not count as affordable housing. It's 60% AMI. And what that means in terms of like real dollars is that a family of three, which is the average household size in San Antonio, has a total income of just under $45,000 a year. These numbers get updated every year by HUD. So we follow whatever the current year is. But for rental housing, affordable rental housing goes for 60% AMI households and below. And for home ownership opportunities, we're focusing on folks with 120% AMI and below. So that means for a household of three, about 89,000 a year. But um, it's not sufficient for us to just say, these are the rents or these are the sale prices that um, housing is going for. It also has to be reasonable to those folks' budget, right? It can't exceed 30% of the household's income. And it has to be guaranteed to be within those rates for a certain period of time. Um, so in a lot of cases, that can be 15 to say 40 years, all the way up to 99 years, depending on what the funding mechanism of the program is. So that's a lot of information, but when we talk about affordable housing, that's what we mean is um, housing for folks who have less than 60% AMI, if it's rental, and less than 120% AMI for home ownership. <laughs> the next slide has a lot of information on it, um, but what the second thing that we did once we had kind of our definition was look at, you know, what's the need in our community, right? So here's what we found. On this chart, you see 95,000 um, households in San Antonio that are not only cost burdened, meaning that they pay more than 30% of their income on their housing, but there, for those 95,000 households, there isn't even an affordable option within the neighborhood in which they currently live. And we use census tracts as a proxy for neighborhoods in this exercise. So for us, that really represented both 
um, a, a need, a demand, right? And a lack of supply. So we broke that number down even further to show how many of those folks are homeowners. And you see those on the left side of the screen in red. And what exactly is their income group, right? So we see a lot of these folks on the homeowner side um, are below 30% AMI, 20%. So they may be folks who have paid off their homes and, and property tax is what they pay now, right? And on the flip side, more than half of these folks are renting. And more than half of those folks are below 30% or excuse me, below 50% AMI. So what we took from this was we really need to focus um, our efforts here over these next several years on folks with the lowest incomes, especially zero to 30% AMI, and also on preservation. So we set new targets for producing and preserving affordable housing. And that total goal over the next 10 years is 28,094 units, new or preserved. And you'll see on this chart that about half of them are dedicated to households with zero to 30% AMI. So this means um, a pretty high level of investment, but a really good return for community, right? Um, there's a note here that uh, some of these units are set aside um, for a program called permanent supportive housing. This is something that um, comes with extra supports, usually for folks who have been homeless for a period of time and are gonna need a little extra help to stay and be healthy in housing. We have um, examples of permanent supportive housing in San Antonio um, that is operated by great providers like SAM, but what we're really looking for in the ship is something that is actually site-based, like a dedicated development where people can go, get services on site, whether that's mental health care, um, physical health care, counseling, you name it. Um, this is something that is an evidence-based model. We see it around the country and we know we're ready for it in San Antonio. So that's a focus for us. And then we're also wanting to make sure that we have um, some age-restricted housing, which means generally folks over 55, um, you know, if they want to live in a community um, with like-minded folks and, and folks with similar lifestyles, then we do have programs to support that. All right, our next shift um, was really towards preservation. And one of the things that was um, interesting about the ship, right, and Christine could speak to this, is that we were actually crafting it kind of at the peak of COVID and through winter storm Yuri. So everybody at the table for this um, had those experiences actively happening around them and they really brought that to the table in crafting this plan. So I think one of the reasons that you see such a um, increased focus on preservation is really that, you know, um, we have invested more in preservation through our new affordable housing bond um, and some of our other programs as well since this. We're excited to, to make some progress there. So I'm not going to go through all of this, but for those of you who like tables of numbers, this is how it all breaks down across home ownership goals, rental goals, production, preservation, and AMI. Um, we'll make sure you have a copy of this presentation so you can see it. So all of that sounds great, right? But how do we pay for it? Um, and we think that roughly over the next 10 years, this is going to cost about $3.37 billion. Um, it's a lot of money, but the good news is that most of that, actually two for every one dollar, is leveraged funds. That means it comes from the federal government um, through like the housing tax credit program or various HUD lending models, private activity bonds. Um, this is good. This is money that we don't have to spend. It doesn't come from us. But we um, need new funding sources, right? We need new investments. And so you see on the right side of the screen here um, what we think we can do, right? So the first two uh, at the top that you see are our housing bond. Um, on May 7th, the voters, uh, thank you, passed our first housing bond of $150 million, which is historic and amazing. And we just put our RFPs out. Um, so we're very excited to see you know, what results we get. Um, we're, and we're hoping that we can do the same thing five years from now in 2027. 
So in addition, we have our um, affordable housing budget, which over the next 10 years we estimate to be about 277 million. We had a one-time infusion from Home ARPA, um, which will focus on permanent supportive housing. Um, we have a couple of mechanisms within the city around tax exemptions or tax increment reinvestment zones. Some of your plan area, planning areas may overlap with those tax increment reinvestment zones. Um, those are very important funding mechanisms for us. And our partners, San Antonio Housing Trust, um, anticipate about 35 million in funding rounds. And I realized it didn't change Saha to Opportunity Home here, but Opportunity Home has uh, a small federal allocation that they get every year for preserve preserving their public housing units. So we've taken these factors all together to kind of combine what, what we think we can do. And that results in a, a $2 leverage for every $1 we invest locally. Sarah, this is Christine. Do you want yeah. questions at the end or do you want to you go through it first or do you want questions as we, you go through? What do you think, Chris? Is it, is it easier for you either one way or the other? No difference to me. It's really about the flow of your presentation, Sarah, whatever you're comfortable with. Why don't I pause here? Because this has been a lot of content and take some questions. OK, I just had a quick one on the um, 22 bond. You know, that's that's wonderful. Um, and I'm just thinking five years down the road um, when we're sitting at the bond <laughs> uh, committees tables again, what are the metrics that are going to be used for the 2022? So when people are sitting at the 2027 saying, what did you do with it? We should or should not move forward with 27 money. Um, I mean, not what are they, but have will there be metrics established? So um, the best uh, you can make the best case for the 27 bond. Christine, that is a great question. Um, and I'm going to lean a little bit on Mark here, but I will say this. Both the Housing Commission and the Community Bond Committees um, put a lot of thought into how these bond dollars should be spent. And they established um, some parameters and principles for how the money should be expended, including that income-based housing that adjusts as folks' income goes up or down, um, and housing that is already very deeply affordable be prioritized. Um, and they also put a lot of other things in there that are good, you know, needed things around sustainability and universal design. Um, so it's a very high bar to get housing bond dollars. And I think one of the exciting things to come from that is, you know, we get to show off some really cool projects as a result of it. And so the way that projects score against those parameters and frameworks, I think will tell that story of, you know, how the bond was successful or not. Um, and then honestly, you know, some of the essentials, how many units did we get and what AMI are they serving? Okay. Mark, do you want to add? Yeah, I, I, I would say just one, one way to look at it and one way that I'm really tracking is kind of the math. If you look at our target over the 10 years of just over 28,000 homes that either or, or rental properties that either have been rehabbed, preserved or newly built, you know, over the five year period, we're looking at probably around 14,000. So that's just kind of the straight math. Now, one of the things that we're looking at closely is that even though the thousand uh, beds of permanent supportive housing we indicated, you know, is needed over the 10 year period, what we've actually come to learn is that we need all of those now. Uh, when you think about all of the issues of people experiencing homelessness, kind of what's that look at, that looks like across our whole community. We need that option in our housing continuum now. And so our ability to be able to move those uh, dollars out quicker to organizations that are ready to move on permanent supportive housing, I think will be a key metric to look at so that we can determine what kind of impact are we having. Um, and I think to the other points that Sarah, you know, laid out, I think are going to be other metrics. We have we're going to roll out a housing dashboard that we're going to have on a regular basis that'll be open to the entire community. So would would hope that you would be looking at the dashboard. Um, and then obviously, if you're involved in the ship strategy, we're going to be evaluating our success based on the ship strategies. But at the end of the day, in my mind, it's what were we able to do? 
what were we able to produce in terms of new construction and what were we able to rehab or preserve in terms of existing stock. Um, that's going to be the real indicator in our ability to, to meet those goals and hit those targets, which is what we're working on and I believe we will do. Uh, we'll indicate, you know, uh, uh, how we look for the 27 bond. The other thing I hope can happen too, we're going to launch a community education campaign that we hope that you all are involved with in terms of helping to shape it. I hope that our community's knowledge and education around housing affordability grows um, so that, you know, it's a more informed process the next time around that we're identifying uh, targets and areas that we know we've missed the first time around that we really need to impact and hit the second time around and potentially even more dollars, you know, if that's if that's a possibility. So th that's what I would add to this discussion. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Now, I was on the infrastructure bond committee and, you know, there's so many, you know, I don't want to say pitchforks, but, um, <laughs> you know, p people wanting a piece of the pie that, you um, um this is going to be really really important um i would i would have hoped to have even seen more uh next time around but that everything was done so well that um it deserves to be pushed up because certainly the need as you mentioned it'll be front loaded um with some of the programs so thank you thank you christine Any others? I keep going. I can't right. see everybody the way my screen is, so if anybody has a question, feel free to just unmute yourself and uh, and say something. And then, Sarah, the only other thing that's coming in the chat was Melanie Cowart uh, had made a note that the preservation piece was very important and appreciated. Thank um, you, Melanie. So, and Melanie um, is such a leader in that space, so um, you really do have a. a a jewel among you for that. Thank you for that uh, affirmation. We appreciate that. All right. Well, now let's transition on into the strategies. So as I mentioned earlier, there are 36 in the ship and these were sourced um, from a lot of other local plans and the experience of the 80 some stakeholders that were around the virtual table as we were crafting this plan. Um, again, not going to go through all of them, but know broadly that they're categorized into five policy areas. If you're familiar with the housing policy framework back from 2018, um, then these five policy areas will look familiar to you. Um, developing a coordinated housing system. Thank you, Mark. That's, you know, just him personally. Increasing city investment in housing. Increasing affordable production and preservation protecting and promoting neighborhoods, and ensuring accountability to the public. Those are our five policy areas of which the 36 strategies fit. These are some of the plans that we sampled um, through our time together. Um, some familiar ones for you, like SA Tomorrow, but also um, the Bear County Health Plan, Opportunity at Risk about preservation, SA Climate Ready, SA Ready to Work, the Status of Poverty Report, our strategic plan on homelessness, uh, keep essay moving, Christine, um, and a handful of others, not least of which, of course, is our housing policy framework, um, which was really the document that sent, set all this in motion. All right, so now I just want to talk about a couple of things that um, I think are relevant to y'all's work, um, and I'll start with a few that have been um, sort of in the news of late, if you will. So one of the strategies in 2022 was to develop and implement a displacement impact. And I'm very proud to say that in our 2022 housing bond RFP that went out last week, um, we have done that. So yay. The goal of this tool um, is to identify displacement drivers in the neighborhood around where a development is proposed. So these could be things like um, slightly higher eviction rates than the city as a whole, if there um, is a lot of deferred maintenance in the area, um, even some investment activity, right? So before we want to make investments in neighborhoods, we want to understand kind of what are the pressures on the people who already live there and how might we be able to mitigate those things um, as we do invest. 
So in its first phase, it is a pilot specifically for the new construction bond funded developments. Um, so we'll be watching this really closely in this first RFP round um, to kind of see how what we learn, what changes we make to the tool, um, and hopefully be able to expand it to other types of funding and other types of investments. Um, so far, we've had some interest from other cities and states in this program um, who are also watching it and hopefully um, will learn with us um, and we'll be looking about, you know, what can we apply to other programs in the future. A couple of other strategies, and I, I put these two on one slide because they're very closely related. Um, as many of you probably know, our Unified Development Code, or UDC, is in the process of being updated. Um, PCDC, Planning Community Development Committee, will get an update on that tomorrow. And some of the amendments that were submitted came from um, our Housing Commission. And most of those amendments have to do with increasing the number of accessory dwelling units in the community. So these proposed amendments um, have to do with specifically the design guidelines around ADUs. Um, we'll hopefully be able to pass those through council um, and start um, other programs around ADU development, um, like supporting folks who want to convert into affordable ADUs, um, preserve their existing ADUs, um, and make sure that they, they go for folks who want to rent affordably. So we're working closely with LISC and a couple of other organizations on, on kind of what that could look like. And I want to give Anissa uh, a shout out on this call because she's been working with us really closely. I appreciate her um, wisdom and the council office's report. And Sarah, just in case some folks on the call aren't familiar with the term, could you just give like a quick version of ADUs? Oh, sure. I Thank imagine a lot that. of people have heard the term, but maybe not everybody. Yeah. You know what's probably a better term to use is like a casita or a mother-in-law unit. Um, any sort of sometimes attached, sometimes detached uh, dwelling that that shares a lot with a single family structure. So the next two are a couple that um, I thought might be relevant and interesting to you all, and they're they're a little bit further off, a little bit in the works. Um, the first exciting one is establishing a community land trust, and our partners at the San Antonio Housing Trust have been working with us on this. Um, and we're exploring how we might be able to use our bond funding for it as well. Um, if you aren't familiar with a community land trust, this is a really exciting model, especially when you apply it to housing. Um, it was born out of the civil rights movement when um, a group of black farmers in Atlanta needed a mechanism to protect their land um, from, from being taken from them. So they created a land trust, which is effectively a nonprofit um, entity that just holds the land. I'm getting a little bit of a, a beeping sound. I don't know if folks can just double check that they're on mute. Thank you. So the, the mechanism of the trust holds the land and any improvements on it, in this case houses, um, are held by the owner of the house. So that does a couple things, but the main benefit is that it removes it from the speculative market. So this is a great option for people who might be feeling today like they're never gonna be able to afford a house, right? Um, but they can through a land trust model, which has um, controlled resale prices, um, set amounts of equity. We can still build equity um, through this program um, and a great way to really hold um, and build generational wealth over time. So this is a structure that we're really interested in exploring, especially as an anti-displacement and preservation strategy. And I thought it'd be something that you all would be excited to see. And lastly, um, I really wanted to close by emphasizing the importance of the strategy around a thousand units of site-based permanent supportive housing. Um, we know that there is a need for at least these a thousand units um, for folks today who are likely unhoused and going through a great deal of suffering, right? These are our neighbors. We want them to be successful in housing. And we know that there isn't just a market generated solution that's gonna be the right fit for them, right? So we do have some progress to report on this strategy. Um, there is an organization called Housing First Communities who is in the process of building our very first site-based development in San Antonio um, over on the east side. 
it's very, very inspiring kind of tiny home grouping. Um, and so we'd love to keep you all posted as that kind of moves and takes shape. It's going to be a very exciting thing when that opens up. Hey, Sarah. Yes. Before you move on too far and jump into the conversation there, uh, Melanie had a question in the chat, which was, does the land trust hold the land free of property taxes? So it depends a little bit on the structure. Um, generally, um, people who own homes in land trusts do pay property taxes, but it is it, it is a, a much reduced portion and that reduction grows over time, if that makes sense, because the value is appraised separate from the land beneath it. It's only on the improvement and appraisers base it on the resale value of the home, which is not based on the market. It's based on um, the ground lease that holds, that controls the value of the improvement. So they pay a tax based on what they could resell the property for, which, you know, depending on the organization, the individual trust itself could be, you know, 2% worth of equity or, or something like that. So yes, they pay taxes, but it is a, a far reduced amount compared to properties that are not in a trust. And, and Chris, we think this is a viable strategy. One of the issues that we're concerned about and we're trying to work really hard on is, especially in the inner core with older housing stock um, and maybe folks that are retired or at, at a certain income band um, and <clears throat> say a major rehab being done on their, on their property, their, their valuation going up by $100,000. Just think of everybody's tax statements this year and then their their inability to pay those taxes and losing the property that's a big concern so community land trust you know can be a viable option in those situations potentially but we're looking at other options as well like circuit breakers and it, and we're having ongoing conversations with the chief appraiser uh to look at you know covenants that we have existing you know with uh people that are going through the the, the rehab program so um, it is it is a concern and it's an issue we're working on and welcome any ideas or thoughts that people have uh, based on their own experience working in that space. Thanks. That's awesome. And Sarah, a follow up question was in there and I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure if you'll be able to give an answer to this in the in the time that we have, but Pam Peck had asked, can you give a concrete example of how a land trust works for housing development? Donna, maybe just a little bit more info on maybe how it comes into being and, and a couple operating principles, maybe, uh, if you think yeah. that's reasonable. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll do my best here. And I would encourage folks who are interested in this to look up some um, programming and research done by especially Grounded Solutions Network. Um, they're really kind of a thought leader uh, on this model. But um, effectively, what a, a land trust is, is... Um, a nonprofit that is probably somewhat analogous to um, like a pro almost like a property manager or or even a homeowners association. Typically, they have a, a tripartite board um, that's made up of an even mix of the homeowners themselves or um, in some communities, there are rental options as well. So it can be renters uh, as well as housing finance uh, experts, attorneys, bankers, et cetera, um, and then, you know, staff, other stakeholders. And that board um, is in charge of sort of making the overall management decisions for the trust, when to buy additional land, um, when to invite new folks into the trust, right, through the sale mechanism, and really for um, maintaining the ground lease. And the ground lease is really the fundamental mechanism by which the um, units of housing are kept affordable. So that trust, the trust as an organization, is in charge of, of stewarding the land, stewarding the organizational health um, of the entities. Each homeowner pays a very small fee every month into the trust. That can be as small as like 10 to $15. Um, just to support its operations, which means that it generally needs funding from some other source. But those payments and fees are 
um, indicators of buy-in and early indicators. Sometimes if people miss their fees that maybe there's other trouble there that um, through financial counseling or or some some work with the household can make sure that they're not you know inching towards foreclosure, right? So the ground lease also sets the terms for how the property can be resold, um, what the percent of equity is. So let's say in this example, it, it's 2%. You can make 2% equity on the property every year. And at year 20, you want to sell it. You can sell it for the price you bought it for, plus that 2% equity that has built over time. So um, a lot of folks can choose to keep it within their, their family as long as um, their family also income qualify to buy the, the home at an affordable price. Um, but people do uh, also graduate on to like market rate housing too with that equity that they earned. So the idea is that you have perpetual affordability through the trust mechanism. The ground lease is 99 years and um, you know it, it, it goes through multiple households and families that um, have a lot of support as they live in the trust. And there actually are trust examples in Austin and in Houston that are fairly new, but it's proof that we can do them in Texas and uh, they can result in some good outcomes for those homeowners. I don't know if that answered your question, but there's some information for you. <laughs> and we posted the Grounded Solutions uh, URL in the chat as well, if anybody wants to go directly there. I agree, it's a great, great resource. That's where I really started learning about Community Land Trust five, six years ago. I think they're awesome. Yeah, so. awesome. They actually okay. got their start as like an association of land trusts. So hmm. most of their, their members are experts because they do it. No other questions in the chat. So I think you can jump onto your conversation slide. Great. Well, um, assuming there aren't other questions, it's okay if those surfaces we keep going. I wanted to hear from you all, um, you know, what might have resonated with you about the ship, either from this presentation or if you've got side hand knowledge of it, um, please share. And specifically, you know, how do you see the ship and your sub area plans really shaping housing affordability for the folks who live in your sub area? Um, and I'm going to see if I can minimize my screen share so I can see the chat, although I would really invite folks to um, unmute themselves and, you know, throw some ideas out for us. Uh, Sarah, this is uh, Joe Silman. Hi, Joe. My, my question is, do you have goals for each of the planning groups as it relates to the number of affordable housing units that uh, we should consider in our plans? Joe, that's a great question. Um, we don't have goals for you for each of your sub area plans. Um, we're hoping that each of you will take this knowledge and um, seek to maximize, you know, what you can for your sub areas um, and using what you know about how we expect our population to grow um, over the next several years. But you probably, just... have, you probably have a better understanding of the needs in each of our planning groups than we would as it relates to uh, income levels. But I understand what you're saying. Joe, I would also say that, um, and if we haven't done it, Sarah, maybe we can drop um, a, a link to the SHIP. Um, the SHIP document itself, Joe, does provide, um, I think, valuable information on what our, currently, our community currently is looking at related to uh, housing affordability and some of the needs. Um, so that could be a, um, a starting point I mean, it's not part of the sub area plan, but it can give you a lot of good data and information um, as you're considering your sub plan. Thank you for that. Yeah, and I would just echo that. Those of you that are on our four regional center plans that we're working on, uh, in your last couple of meetings, you've heard about kind of the overall housing and job projections for your areas, um, and that's total housing and total jobs. Um, but yeah, several of our consultants are on this call as well and, and learning more and more about the ship. So, um, you know, we may not be able to provide an exact number, but we certainly have some of that data on the AMI levels in your in your sub areas 
Um, and, you know, as we dive into the housing conversation more in your next two planning team meetings, um, you know, we can integrate some of that information for you all as a planning team uh, to have a deeper discussion about for sure. Other questions? I'll make, a, I'll have a, a question. This is Christine. Um, first of all, comment, great presentation. On the education uh, comment about educating the community, I think it's important to educate those who are, I won't use the word NIMBYs, but um, that even though this program may never affect, touch, whatever, my life, um, not, not my personal life, but you know, someone's life, it's important for them to know how it can benefit them in other ways. And I guess I, I liken this to a transit analogy that I may never step foot on a bus, but if there's a whole bunch of people on the corridor that I drive transitioning to a bus that helps my drive every morning or you know in the evening for um, because there's fewer cars on the road. And so um, just to keep in mind that it, it sh should benefit everybody regardless if you directly participate. Um, and then just to comment on the sub area plans, I tend to be on the ones that are more inner city. And so the location of rapid transit corridors is very important. And the more that we can marry affordable housing directly on transit corridors and eliminate that requirement for a vehicle, you know, the better, <clears throat> um, economic uh, level our uh, our folks can have and so i know there's always the the drive to find cheap land out in the hinterlands uh, to build affordable housing and then come say bring a transit route to us um, when it's you know trying to use the reverse of locating that affordable housing near transit corridors um, to have better options, not just for one line, but for transfers to be able to locate people, you know, where they could possibly work or be educated. Um, and so, as we, um, you know, at, at VIA, we're going also through a process, not, not in cycle with the current UDC, but kind of an out of cycle process soon to come of um, revamping um, the code for transit oriented development. Uh, being able to integrate, you know, affordable housing is is really, really important. And I know, you know, our board is committed to making that um, click with both land use and transportation and um, housing. And then lastly, on some of these inner city plans that have a lot of industrial land near major corridors, I think that's a really great opportunity for transition of land use to the more mixed use and especially urban mixed use um, uh, classifications that would support um, affordable housing and be close to transit. Christine, if I could just respond to that, I think to the last point, one of the strategies that we're looking at right now is around land banking. And so to your point, if we can purchase land and bank it now, uh, realizing that after we go through our, you know, iterations of housing bond dollar disbursement and we're learning through that process, I think you're exactly right. And I think land banking can help us with that. <clears throat> Recently, I've been invited by VIA to join on the, on, on the group that's looking at the North South uh, San Pedro. And so I'm having a meeting with Cami, I think in early September, to look right. at, you know, how we can look at housing. So we are with you 100% on that. We are looking for transit oriented housing uh, and even talking to school districts about the same type of thing for school districts as well. And and th thank you for your comments on, on the education. Um, it's my belief that we need a new narrative. We need new frames in which to talk about um, housing affordability. Uh, when I first got into the job, started to go out in the community and I talked about affordable housing, I ran into a lot of resistance. But as I began to talk about it in terms of housing affordability, I found that everyone can relate to that. 
uh, because everyone deals with that either on their own or in their family it's in some form or fashion. And the fact that affordable housing is already in your neighborhood. And so I think all of those things, you're just confirming some things that we've been thinking about on this education piece, but that's going to be a longer term effort um, for, for our whole community. So thank you. Well, to the extent that your local transit agency may not be able to use a lot of funds for land banking, I would encourage land banking specifically around our transit stations. So keep those dots in mind. All right, so, thank you. Yeah, thank you both. It looks like we have a, a question and I would just mention real quick to uh, Mark. I think I mentioned it to you, but there's a, a pretty interesting organization in the Denver area called Urban Land Conservancy. You may be very aware of them, but they did exactly what you and Christine talked about. Chris, you muted. I'm muted. And and uh, anyway, they did exactly that. They land banked around uh, the growing light rail transit network in Denver uh, and have been able to facilitate a lot of great um, affordable housing projects and other community oriented projects. So a cool resource to look into. Um, and then Brenda uh, Pacheco had her hand up with a question. Yes, thank you. Um, so I, I apologize. I signed on late because I didn't realize I was going to have to download the app. I didn't already have it. Um, so I missed some pieces of the presentation, but mostly the things that I heard, of course, the things that are important to me was um, was um, land trust. And I thought I heard the, the term displaced or displacement. Is that correct? Yes. OK, so I, I, I was trying to listen, but I was having difficulty. So does that apply? Does that apply then to, let's say, for instance, there is a community behind um, Mission San Jose uh, on Pyron Street where many of those residents uh, have been there for generations and generations. Could they could they get together? Could they band together and 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 then create a land trust for their properties in the event that a government entity and it could be any, it could be the National Park Service, it could be Texas, you know, wildlife or any any entity that might want to come in and then ha displace them. Would this land trust, if it was in effect, apply? So um, if they formed a land trust, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that the, the primary function of that as an anti-displacement mechanism is in keeping the costs stable and removing it from the speculative market. And I am not familiar with um, the operating, the operations of like the National Park Service. But I do believe that um, because you would have a ground lease in place, right? Uh, it would make it more difficult for an entity to come in and, and purchase those properties and especially more difficult for any sort of predatory investor not putting the park service in that category but you know we all get the the phone calls about if we're selling our houses right mm -hmm. so that ground lease is very protective and there is no incentive for a predatory investor who would be seeking to speculate to acquire them because that's specifically what the land trust is designed to prevent so um in that sense it, it could be protective it depends on you know exactly what would happen and you know i'm, I'm sure that there are um, you know, easements and things like this that might be relevant in that particular situation that I'm not familiar with. But, you know, in general, land trusts are a great way for communities to to lock in, you know, what they what they have established together. So I, guess, so I guess my real question is that eminent domain could not be used to come in and and just uh, take several of the homes on that on that one community, that one street. That I don't know, Brenda, and I, I apologize. Would OK. I okay. think it would be pretty situational specific. OK, OK, thank you. Are there other questions or going back to the question Sarah posed, uh, you know, anyone else with thoughts on how the ship resonates with them or how they feel it may be applicable in their area? And I forget what the second question was, uh, specific strategies maybe. Uh, let's see, uh, 
Brenda's hand, I think, was still up from before, but Melanie has her hand up. Melanie, if you have a question. Um, I don't have a question and I need to leave the conversation. Uh, but what I wanted to say is I am so proud to live in an area where there is a ship um, and where there is a, a plan to both construct affordable housing as well as to preserve it. As Sarah knows, uh, the Roseville Housing Trust has been in existence for over 50 years and uh, the city has been so helpful to us in uh, preserving the uh, 88 uh, affordable housing units that we have for uh, senior citizens. And we, we currently have additional land, which is why I asked the question about putting property in a land trust, because we're going to have to start paying property taxes on it because we haven't yet developed it. Um, but in the future, we are going to develop uh, additional affordable housing. And so, I, again, I'm just grateful uh, that we live in an area where there is a plan, where the city is concerned. And I, uh, I do want to echo uh, the, 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 the person who spoke and said that we do need to educate the community more about how affordable housing isn't just good for the people who have the affordable housing, but it's good for the community as a whole. Um, and I think that to do that, we ought to sometimes focus get the press to focus on the really good uh, affordable housing units that are going up in the city uh, to just see how beneficial it is. But I want to thank Sarah uh, and everyone who uh, in the neighborhood uh, uh, housing and services department because they're just great. And if you can use them, use them. And good night. <laughs> I need to go. <laughs> bye bye. I'm going to leave on that note too. Bye. <laughs> Let's see. Right now, I don't see any others with hands up with comments or questions, but we can give it another minute. I will say as folks are starting to log off, um, me and, and, and the whole team, Mark, Sibonet, everyone, um, our inboxes, our phones are always open to you um, as you have questions. So I know that Chris is going to make sure you get this presentation. I'll send the slide deck to you, Chris, so you have that as well, um, along with our contact information. Um, but one of the cool things that we are doing with the ship is um, kind of taking a rolling uh, call for volunteers, if you will, as these strategies come due to start being worked on over the course of the 10 years. Um, if, if you take a look at the ship and see something that um, really, you know, kind of wets your whistle, if you will, um, I heard a lot of interest in community land trusts, so I hope I see all of your names. Um, click this link that I'll put in the chat um, so you can sign up and, and help us you know, actualize that plan. Um, you might not get a, a call back tomorrow or even next month, right? But as that plan kind of comes due, we'll be sure to reach out. And in the meantime, um, add you to our listserv so you get um, updates on the ship and anything related to NHSD. So we'll keep you keep you in the loop. awesome yeah and, and for the the planning team members on the call you know as we really dive into discussions about housing uh you know particularly the next couple meetings um you know we'll be able to call upon sarah and mark and their team uh with questions uh you know like to brenda's point if we have a real specific strategy that you're interested in for your area but we really need to fine tune it or we need to understand trade-offs of that strategy versus another one you know we'll we'll be able to lean on sarah and mark and their team uh, to make sure that we get the right information and write the recommendation and the narrative in our plan uh, the correct way. Um, and we've got some very talented consultants that are helping us out with that as well who come from a housing background. So uh, we've got a lot of support for you in thinking about these uh, efforts in your sub areas. So. All right. Well, I haven't seen any of their hands go up. Um, I'll Chris, just reiterate what. Oh, Chris. yes. Christine, Christine, again, you just prompted me when you said that about the sub area. Um, we have, you know, at the beginning of each sub area plan, you've got the demographic profile. And is there a way of taking the ship information and overlaying, you know, via maybe a shape file for the demographics as they relate to the whole city? to kind of get a, a general idea on where those 
units might best be served. I think somebody mentioned it earlier in the a meeting. Like, if I knew in Stone Oak that 90% of the 28,000 should go in Stone Oak, would that help me? <laughs> I don't think that's the case, but would that help in terms of the, the planning as the um, you know the land use and the housing and, and transit discussions happen within the sub area plans? Well, I'll take a first step at it, and I think I saw Matt Prosser join. I don't know if he'll have any thoughts, but I mean, I would just kind of repeat back what what both Mark and I said earlier, which is you know I think it's going to be hard to pinpoint really specific numbers for each sub area in terms of affordability. Um, but I think that we can inform the discussion with that demographic data that you talked about. Um, if there's any spatial aspect of that that we can overlay you know, with GIS or any shape files that NHSD may have available that are useful, you know, we, we have the team that can do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think the whole point of doing that initial demographic analysis and the existing additions atlas was to identify, you know, some of those major trends or major demographic issues that we need to be aware of and then make sure we're trying to address those in the housing section, the mobility section, whichever section is most appropriate to some of those questions. Uh, and Matt, I, not to put you on the spot, I don't know if you had any additional thoughts about that or, or Mark, Stephen A, anybody who's been nodding. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just generally what we're going to be doing in the planning team meetings is a, a couple of things. Uh, we can look at what the sort of spread of households by AMI level is in each of the sub areas that we're looking at and how that compares to the city, but also sort of to the goals laid out in the ship. Um, we also measure cost burden for each of the sub areas to get a sense of the number of households, both owners and renters that are experiencing uh, or paying more for housing than a, an average household should. And then the last thing that we could also do, take a kind of a step forward than we have in previous years, uh, is we have looked at sort of occupational um, wage data um, and sort of looked at the highly, you know, the occupations that are uh, have a large presence in each sub area and sort of look at what the associated wage is for those occupations. And we can try to translate that into what uh, affordable rent or home ownership, you know, how much they can spend on uh rent or mortgage each month and how that might relate to affordability levels as well and uh, i think it's important to to look at both um the households um as well as the the workforce within an area um to understand needs okay thank you very much Thanks, and i was Matt. just also doing a quick calculation on escalation so i calculated that that next bond needs to be at least 185 million Let's just round it up to 200. <laughs> Chris, I, I just wanted to comment on Matt's, uh, you know, the, the ship is really a living document, so it's constantly being updated and changing and shifting. We'd be very interested in seeing what you all come up with as you're looking at, you know, uh, housing affordability, cost burden, you know, information, you know, we're learning almost daily pockets of, of uh, areas, you know, medical center, other areas of town where uh, the need for, you know, deeper affordability around AMI bands is present. So any information, I mean, we welcome, we kind of love data and look at data, but I think it's real time what you all are pulling up and I think it could be very beneficial for us. Yeah, we're happy to share as we develop each of those sections. We'll definitely keep you guys apprised and, and we'll look for your feedback on it to Make sure it seems like we're on the right track or we're you know you're seeing what we're seeing that would be great thank you i love that and if, if i can just kind of tag on to to an important point that matt said about you know employment data right because it's not just cost burden about uh, among the people who already live in your sub area it's all the people who commute to it to serve coffee to make sure that folks have food to teach our children to be caregivers to clean homes, you know, they shouldn't have to, as Christine put it, you know, basically drive till they qualify for housing. You know, that that isn't um, what we want to see in our community. It should be space for everyone everywhere. 
So I would really encourage you if you take nothing else from this conversation to really go into your planning process with that spirit and think, you know, how can we do this work in a way that would allow for all the members um, who work, play, live in our sub areas, um, you know, to really make it home regardless of their income level. That's awesome. I think that might be a perfect closing note, Sarah. The inspiring send off speech, I think, was was maybe perfect because I haven't seen any new hands go up and uh, we've lost about 10 people from the the call. So unless there's any last minute hands or comments, I think we'll we'll let Sarah's inspiring words carry us off into the rest of the evening and our planning process in the coming weeks and months. Thank you everyone all for right. this opportunity. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for all taking the time. We really appreciate your work and, and everything it does to support ours. So thanks for the collaboration. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. And thank all the planning teams for uh, members for joining. We know it was an extra meeting for you, but we hope you got something out of it. So thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. All right. Good night.